part of them. Good morning and happy new year. Everyone. My name is Greg Gilligan. I'm the communications director here at RVA 757 Connects. Happy new year to everyone and thank you for joining us for our first uh, virtual innovation spotlight for 2023. We have an exciting program this afternoon um, as we're going to be talking about the growing entrepreneurial ecosystem in the I-64 Innovation Quarter mega region. Let's see here. So briefly, we'll just, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about what RBA 757 Connects is doing. We'll get into our topic of, of the day. We'll leave some room for, at the very end for some questions and answers, and then we'll talk briefly about what's coming up next. Just want to let you know that we are recording this conversation, this uh, webinar, and um, it'll be available on our website uh, sometime in the next week. And we also, uh, are, if you have a question that you want to ask, uh, please use the chat function, and we'll use that as a way of uh, communicating. Let me just tell you a little bit about RVA 757 Connects. It's an organization that's bringing the power of convening, connecting, and collaborating to the mega region. Um, so the RVA 757 Connects is, is a nonprofit organization dedicated to improving the economic success and quality of life for everybody in the Richmond, which is RVA, and Hampton Roads, which is 757 regions. Uh, we are a network of leaders representing businesses, community, and higher education. We are advancing the Richmond and Hampton Roads a mega region as the I-64 Innovation Quarter, which is a model of innovation and inter-regional inter collaboration. You can see that we are pursuing several different goals and, and priorities. One of those goals, one of those priorities has been for the widening of Interstate 64. Um, in the widening of Interstate 64, that's that 29 miles between New Kent and Williamsburg, that still uh, that stretch is still two lanes in each direction. The hope is that we can get it um, widened to three lanes in each direction. And we've got some some boosts. We've got some boosts um, in December. We get, uh, the um, the Virginia Department of Transportation got word that they received a 25 million dollar federal grant for the project. This is on on top of uh, money already uh, 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 already earmarked for this particular project. It's thanks to our collective efforts that we were able to do this. As you can see, um, we have basically about four, $595 million now for the project. The General Assembly approved and Governor Youngkin uh, uh, signed into law back in June, $470 million. Uh, the Central Virginia Transit Authority uh, added $100 million. Then the, uh, the VDOT uh, federal grant was another $25 million. So we still have, the, the, the project is $750, $750 million. As you can see, uh, much of the funding is in place, but we the project is not fully funded. Secretary of Transportation Chet Miller said during Convergence 2022 gathering in Williamsburg in October that adding that third lane in each direction will unlock the corridor, unifying Richmond and Hampton Roads, growing the economy, providing opportunities for all. He said he will find the needed funding to complete the project. Senator Warners and Senator Kane both also promise to seek more federal support for the project. So RVA 757 Connects will remain vigilant um, as well. The work is progressing. Um, the, in mid-December, Virginia released a what they call a request for qualifications from contractors to widen the first segment of the highway, with, uh, which is almost an 11 mile stretch between Bottoms Bridge to about a mile beyond the new Kent Courthouse exit. The next step will be to request for proposals, which is expected to happen in the spring. And then they'll, uh, the VDOT will award a contract next fall to design and build the first sections. Another one of our goals is, is our priorities is to spearhead the efforts to get the Richmond and Hampton Roads mega region designated as a global internet hub. But we need a strategic plan to do so. And the planning process has already started to do that. We established a strategic planning process that should be completed sometime this March. We conducted a comprehensive situation review and are identifying strategic action plans. We've hired two consultants to help formulate key action plans as well. And then we're gonna bring it all together in a comprehensive strategic implementation plan, which we hope to release sometime in March. We have more than 60 leaders from across the mega region who are part of our steering committee. 
They include companies from like Bank of America and CarMax and digital infrastructure firms like Meta, which is Facebook's parents company, and the Pixel Factory up in Hanover County. We have subsea cable owners and broadband firms and cyber uh, security companies, as well as those rep representing utilities, planning agencies, chambers of commerce, uh, economic development entities, and the military. Strategic Planning Initiative received a $100,000 grant from Go Virginia Region 4 and Region 5. An additional planning funding came from Dominion Energy, Henrico County, Virginia Beach, the Hampton Roads Alliance, Old Dominion University, and Dragonfly Group. We also created a project website, and anyone can go onto this website, not only to see what we're doing, but also to keep up with other uh, information about uh, the whole concept of a global internet hub. If you go under the media tab, for instance, on the website, you can find a variety of stories that have been written on, on this effort. And one of those pages includes um, a full page infographic that ran in the Richmond Times Dispatch in September um, in the insight section that focused on how subsea cables are coming ashore in Virginia Beach and, and they're uh, connected to data centers in Henrico County. We are on our way to becoming a global internet hub all started uh, almost a decade, more than a decade ago in 2012, when Hurricane Sandy caused so much destruction to the New York coastline that it prompted the de development of a third East Coast landing site. I-64 Innovation Quarter has many of these assets, assets in place to be needed as a global internet hub. Coming ashore in Virginia Beach, as you can see on the map here, are three subsea cables, one from Spain, one from France, and one from Puerto Rico and Brazil. A fourth one is planned from South of Africa, and four more cable landings are also planned. These deep sea cables uh, connect in Heraco County, where Meta, again, Facebook's parent company, is investing more than a billion dollars to build a two million square foot data center uh, campus. The first phase of that center opened in 2020. The second phase is scheduled to open sometime early this year. Next door, is a 1.4 million square foot QTS network access point, which is the world's fourth largest data center. And QTS is underway right now to double the size of that facility. Another part of the mega region's internet infrastructure is the location of a DECIX data center neutral internet exchange point in the Richmond region. The German-based company DECIX established three locations in the Richmond area, two in Enrico County and one in Hanover for these exchange points. DICX also has similar exchange points in only four other U.S. markets in New York, Dallas, Chicago, and in Phoenix. So now let's get to the, 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 the program um, that we have on today, which is talking about the entrepreneurial community here in the I-64 Innovation Corridor, um, because it's, it's a robust and growing ecosystem. Both regions have thriving entrepreneurial ecosystems Several business incubators and accelerators uh, in the mega region provide the mentorship that these budding new businesses need. Venture capital for firms and angel investors help finance these new companies. Just take a look at all the various samplings of, of what's available here in the mega region between Richmond and Hampton Roads. But entrepreneurs and startup founders, angel investors, and others say more can be done to support these new businesses here in the mega region. Today, we, we turn to our speakers. We have a, a, a good crop of, of great speakers to be able to talk to this particular topic. Um, it includes an angel investor, another person who's with uh, an early stage venture firm, another person who's the manager director of a, a business accelerator, another person who works with entrepreneurs, and we also have a startup founder as well. Monique Adams is the Managing Director of 757 CoLab and exec is the Executive Director of 757 Angels, which has consistently been recognized as a top angel group in the country by Angel Capital Association. Paul Moldy was named Executive Managing Director of the Richmond-based business accelerator, Lighthouse Labs, in April of 2022. Before that, he served as fund manager and manager director of Riverflow Growth Fund, a seed stage healthcare focused venture capital firm based here in Richmond, and was also a director at NRV, an early stage venture capital firm also based in Richmond. Meg Pride is the founder and CEO of Brandify, 
which is a Richmond-based startup that offers shoppers an online tool to compare various cosmetic and skincare products. Scott Ucrop is Managing Director at NRV, an early stage venture firm in Richmond. Among NRV's portfolio companies, he serves as a board observer to Harrison, uh, Virginia-based farmer Focus Shenandoah Valley Organic, also at Norfolk-based Ario, at Washington State-based uh, Ignic, and at Raleigh, North Carolina-based Murphy's Naturals. And finally, we have Hunter Walsh. Well, Hunter is the program manager for 757 Startup Studios, which is part of the 757 CoLab Innovation Network in Hampton Roads. Walsh works alongside some of the most innovative entrepreneurs in the 757 region, designing critical programming, support startups, and building a valuable network of partners, mentors, ecosystem champions. Regions across Virginia have been working on a regional entrepreneurial initiatives for the last couple of years to update and advance the regional entrepreneurial strategies. And this effort is being funded by Go Virginia. The idea is to produce an inclusive, comprehensive, and sustainable approach to leverage entrepreneurship as a mode of economic development. Monique Adams is going to give us a brief assessment of the one that was happened down in Region 5, which is the Hampton Roads region, which has already been concluded. Monique, and you're on mute. Yeah, so thank you so much, Greg, and thank you for the other panelists that are joining and the folks that are here today. Um, so Greg has asked me to talk about the assessment um, that was done in late 2020 and early 21 that culminated in this um, assessment that was produced by Techstars. Techstars is a globally recognized um, uh, entrepreneurial support organization, which um, primarily does acceleration, but also has an arm that focuses on ecosystem development. And that arm actually conducted this survey. Um, they went through a very intentional process. Um, and, and the goal of the paper was to ultimately assess strengths, gaps, and make some recommendations um, to uh, stakeholders in our community. They interviewed over 110 stakeholders and it was a pure cross section with the majority of the stakeholders being the founders who um, are at the center of our ecosystem and what actually makes an ecosystem churn. Um, can you go to the next slide? So briefly, um, just to kind of touch on some of the things um, that they concluded. And again, I would reinforce that a lot of these things uh, we already knew, and this report essentially validated the things that, that a lot of the people on the ground knew already. Um, Hampton Roads has a number of key strengths for entrepreneurs, clearly quality of life. There's um, great positive momentum in our ecosystem. So while we're still nascent, we've been growing and um, building and, and that's very positive. Clearly low cost of doing business. We have an incredible talent pool when you stack it up next to other ecosystems across the country. And we definitely have emerging industries um, specifically surrounding um, the water. Could you go to the next slide, please? In terms of gaps or what others might call weaknesses, but we call gaps because they're an opportunity to improve ourselves, um, is the inclusion gap was number one. So we need to make sure that our entrepreneurs reflect uh, the population of the people that we serve so we can do better on inclusion. Storytelling, we need to help create a narrative around successful entrepreneurs. So we need for people to understand that you can actually grow, build, and sell a business in this region, that you don't have to go elsewhere to do that. Later stage funding, um, you've probably heard that before. This continues to be um, a gap, and later on we'll hear from the panelists and we'll maybe find out a little bit more of how much of a gap that that is. Um, we need to engage more entrepreneurs in our decision-making processes. That means including them on boards um, and places where they can make decisions so they can be part of the solutions. We need to measure um, more um, and we need to set up uh, collaborative vehicles so that we can actually be very intentional about our me measurement and we can work together. Next slide. 
So these are the recommendations um, that they have. They actually just are a result clearly of the gap. So engage more tech founders to increase diversity. We talked about the narrative. Um, help founders actually connect them with later stage funding. That might be a challenge. Again, we'll hear from that a little bit more on that from our founder um, panelists as well as the investor panelists. Um, Designing collaborative measurement tools. We are doing a lot of this through our um, 757 CoLab vehicle. We report um, independently and then we report on a consolidated level to show kind of what our, like through our 757 CoLab lens, what the ecosystem is doing. And prioritize collaboration. And one of the ways that um, they recommend doing that is designating a local quarterback in each region to act as a quarterback for the ecosystem. So um, that those were the findings from our report and we are um, very keyed into those here at 757 CoLab um, in order to make a difference in the future. Greg? Hey, thanks. Uh, appreciate that, Monique. And, and Region 4, uh, the Go Virginia Region 4 is also has funded a similar type of study that's being uh, right now is underway by Activation Capital. Uh, they are playing, they're doing the same thing. It's probably several months. They're in the process right now of developing a comprehensive and inclusive regional strategy for this area, the Richmond and Petersburg area. So if you have any uh, thoughts, you want to be part of that, um, see, you know, for more information, use that uh, link or contact someone at Activation Capital. Also, a reminder, just a good reminder, uh, again, if you have any questions, just go into the chat function and we'll do that towards the end of the program. Now I want to turn it over to uh, Monique. To uh, Monique's going to moderate this uh, panel discussion for us today. She's got a tremendous amount of enthusiasm and energy, uh, and and the panel we've all talked about uh, talking about where we've been, where we are, and where we're going. So Monique, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Um, well, I'm I'm really honored to be sitting next to um, these three individuals. I they're incredible professional colleagues and, and also friends. So I look forward to the discussion. What I'd like to do is um, I'll call on each of you. Um, if you could advance the slide one more, I'd appreciate it. Um, so in front of you is a slide that kind of shows um, an entrepreneur's journey, a founder's journey from um, research and development ideation all the way to growth. And then over time, um, it shows where different sorts of organizations would engage with that entrepreneur dependent on their journey. So what I'd like for you all to do is just to briefly introduce yourself, um, talk about your organization or your company and where you fit on this chart to give people context um, for the rest of the discussion. So Paul, could you go first? Certainly, thanks Monique. And, uh... Good, I guess, afternoon now, uh, everyone. Um, so I am the executive manager, managing director of Lighthouse Labs, um, as Greg had said earlier. Um, and we are a seed stage accelerator for companies that are appropriate to venture capital. So these are uh, high growth startups that um, are, are right at that, cust well, a little post-customer discovery, but beginning to commercialize zone. So on this graph and that, clearly see where accelerators fall. Uh, we started back in 2012-ish, and at the time, uh, Richmond's ecosystem, uh, internal ecosystem, was, um, was, was just starting to kind of coalesce, and there was a few versus many players in it. NRV was just starting, um, and for example, and so uh, the focus was more on Richmond centric and promoting the the um, you know entrepreneurs there and helping them. And then uh, through time and space, our brand has grown and we've uh, formalized into uh, full time staff. Um, and and so I've been uh, very fortunate to kind of ride on the coattails of my predecessors. Uh, and we find ourselves at a point now where. Given the um, the scope of acceleration, we uh, focus on Virginia at large and out of out of state occasionally. Um, we have 
uh, kind of moved a little bit later in the stage. So we're looking at really pre seed and seed stage versus companies that are still kind of finding their way uh, in terms of product market fit. Um, much heavier focus on engaging investors uh, and then building out our alumni network because after 10 years, we've got close to 100 alumni companies. So um, I'll stop there and, and um, looking forward to the discussion. Thanks, Paul. Meg, could you um, bring us up to speed on what you've been up to? Absolutely. So I started Brandify while at the Darden School of Business, and we created a mobile app that helps you compare uh, beauty products, like think your high-end $200 moisturizers to more affordable options. And we use the data from our mobile app to actually launch our own skincare line. So it's been a really amazing and fun and interesting intersection between being a consumer packaged goods company with this incredible tech platform that in, helps us acquire customers and also informs our product development process. And we sit somewhere in between one and three. Um, we've raised, you know, I think uh, $4 million to date over our lifespan. And we um, are just kind of, you know, at the gates ready for the race and um, <clears throat> working on getting to that growth phase. Um, did everybody catch what Meg's company does? Can you just, did you say that you were a health and beauty brand? Did yeah, you yeah, we actually were just named there. today. Um, so, so we have our own skincare line and um, today we are named by InStyle as one of the 15 beauty brands, uh, indie beauty brands to watch in 2023. So. Congratulations. Thank that you. Great. Great products, by the way. Um, okay. Thank you, Meg. Uh, Scott, could you um, share a little bit about yourself and NRV? You're on mute. Sorry, I thought my space bar would work. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks, Monique. And uh, I'm honored to be on this panel. Um, yeah, NRV, as Paul said, was founded about um, over 10 years ago, late 2011, early 2012, and really out of a need for, um, as we saw companies that were getting started back then, they were looking elsewhere for additional capital. We thought, how can we keep them in the, in the region? And so that's how we began as New Richmond Ventures. I joined in 2015 as the decision was made to really raise a fund and focus on Series A investments, which puts, puts us on this graph in the commercialization to growth phase. We, we like to think that when we come in there, as Paul said, there's product market fit for the companies that we're investing in. And we're providing growth capital to really add fuel to the fire, if you will, to kind of help these companies um, succeed and really um, fully bake the cake, if you want to take that analogy. Um, and so we have kind of, as we've evolved, we were very Virginia centric um, and found a little bit over time, we're now in year six of our 10 year fund that it was hard to be um, industry agnostic, stage specific and geographically specific, just given sort of the maturity of the, the region. Um, we just found that the companies that we were probably best to help, because uh, we always ask the question, are, is the help the company needs, the help that we can provide. We found that we've had to go a little bit further afield with some of our investors and, and co-investors and investments and sort of syndicates of co-investors. And so we've kind of fallen more into sort of a product, sort of CPG, consumer packaged goods, food, better for you food, better for the planet, non-food types of um, companies that we have invested in. But part of what we're excited about is and part of what the this panel is great about is how do we bring more attention to the region by highlighting companies that are here, talking about investors that are here, that as people look beyond just the um, sort of the, the typical venture capital markets. So um, we feel like there's been, you know, forward progress on, on that front. So thanks, Monique. Thank you. 
And last but not least, Hunter Walsh, 757 Startup Studios. Thanks, Monique. Happy Wednesday, everyone. 757 Startup Studios was the first tenant to move into the Assembly Innovation Campus in the heart of downtown Norfolk in May of 2021. And when we opened our doors, we really completed the vertical continuum of what we call 757 CoLab. That includes 757 Angels, our group of angel investors, 757 Accelerate, our 12-week uh, accelerator program. And then we opened up Startup Studios. And on this chart and graph here, Startup Studios would be hyper-focused on the research and development ideation, getting into the customer discovery phase. We currently work with 30 early stage growth-minded industry agnostic startup founders 90% plus are from the Hampton Roads region. We offer them rent-free tenancy and the su surround them with all of the resources they need to help validate and hopefully scale their idea as fast as possible. Awesome. Thank you, Hunter. Um, all right, so I'm going to call on each of you um, for a series of questions, and um, I'm going to just try to move things around a little bit. Um, so, Paul Noldy, I'll start with you. Um, how do you define uh, Lighthouse's success, and how has that success evolved over time? Yeah, so maybe I'll just start with how it's evolved and how we define it now. So, um, I think at the beginning we really focused. Uh, I would I would submit that we've you know success was defined as okay, we bring in um, a, a cohort of companies, and we're helping them. Uh, find their way, if you will. Our tagline is investing in the lives of founders, and, and that uh, is a core tenant of ours, and that has not changed over the 10 years. Um, but I think the way in which we um, address that has changed. So in the beginning, uh, it was very much, okay, if the if your startup, if you if if you find a product market fit while you're accelerating, and that can lead you to a next inflection point, that is a success. If you also find that there isn't product market fit and maybe you have to pivot or maybe you have to close your doors, um, that's also a success. And I think those are very two very valid paths. Um, again, this was at a point where the ecosystem was, was still um, very nascent and young. Um, I think today, largely because we have much more infrastructure built from a, a entrepreneurial support organization perspective with pre-acceleration and you've got the 757 collabs in the world and you've got Startup Virginia and you've got Activation Capital, you've got a lot more resources. It's allowed um, Lighthouse Labs to now focus on um, helping these companies, accelerating these companies uh, to um, a, a meaningful round of funding that will then allow them to hit their next growth point. So less about maybe finding your way and more about finding that, that critical capital. Um, now, again, our, our programming is still very much focused around the founder and, and, um, and, and again, that won't change, but I think it's, it's just in the way that you address that. So um, we'll see, I mean, we have, we're looking ahead to the next 10 years. And so we're in a little bit of a transition point, but uh, again, I, I think for us, we're grateful to all of our partners that are on this call um, and around the state that really, you know, have helped us um, get to this point and liberated us to, to be able to um, kind of expand our, our focus. Oops. Thanks, Paul. Mm -hmm. Um, Hunter, why are innovation and ideation spaces um, so important in a community? At Startup Studios, we're kind of like the front door to the innovation and entrepreneurial ecosystem in the region. So that gives us a unique perspective to stay kind of on the cutting edge of what the general population is working on. So that allows us to kind of be able to see uh, some of these new and emerging themes like Web3 or crypto when that was important there so that we can then plan and understand what types of programming, what those needs are. And because we're industry agnostic, like many of the other panelists there, that the needs that different industries require vary 
quite drastically. And we're a startup ourselves, so we're always figuring out and iterating along the way. But I think like Paul, we are founder first and really want to take the time to get to understand that person and human that we're people and humans before we're founders and entrepreneurs. So I think that's important to put that into perspective that while we're very business minded, metric driven folks, sometimes kind of taking a step back and creeping and crawling instead of going to a full blown sprint ultimately is in the best interest with surrounding that entrepreneur with as holistically speaking as much much knowledge as you can expect at that stage that they're in. Thanks, Hunter. So Meg, you're up next. And I'm wondering, you've participated in a number of these programs. What has been the value of these programs? How have the programs helped you move the needle? Absolutely. So it's um, we have been uh, supported by, I think, all the, the entities on the call in some form or another. And um, they help guide you through to each next phase. So what matters as an entrepreneur to your business at each phase differs pretty greatly. So when you're in, you know, this first stage versus the third stage and different accelerators, different programs are, I'd say, kind of what is the launching pad to get you to that next phase, whether it's, you know, learning how to build a financial model to pitch investors for the next phase, even learning what the metrics are um, is really important. And so that's kind of what they help guide you through. So we did, I mean, we've done Lighthouse, we did a later stage accelerator in Cincinnati, um, and it's just been very valuable to shape, shape the outcome of our business. Great. Um, Scott, so sort of uh, leveraging or riffing off of Meg's last answer, how does NRV or how do you personally, or how does NRV view pro, uh, founders that have come through these programs? Great question. It really, um, it really helps kind of guide founders in these earlier stage companies with respect to what they need to, you know, one, just what do they need to, do is they're building their business, but two, they get a lot of great coaching on just how to approach fundraising and on um, potential investors. And so we really feel like it's a, as companies are going through these um, programs, it's that's the best time to meet um, founders and just their earlier stage team. So it's um, they really do a great service um, for for the region and just elsewhere. So um, you know, we're all all about it. Yeah, I would echo that from a 757 Angels perspective. So thanks for that. Um, so going back to Paul, um, from, uh, from a Lighthouse Labs perspective, since, the, since um, we have established that these organizations are really important, what have been your biggest challenges operationally and aspirationally? Yeah, so um, we are a nonprofit, um, have been from the beginning, and we actually don't take any equity in companies. We, in fact, grant companies $20,000 to come through the, the accelerator program. Um, so for us, the challenge has always been um, one of um, more operational funding and, and finding a sustainable business model. Um, you know, we've been very fortunate because historically we've had some really strong funding partners like VIPC, um, Go Virginia, Activation Capital, but, um, you know, that can't go on forever. So we have to, I think, moving forward, figure out a way to either um, find the, the grant support for innovative new ideas and how to refine and, and optimize our program um, uh, and or find a way that we can move towards some sustainable uh, business model. So, you know, it's, it's a, um, it, you're just trying to always kind of stay ahead of that. Um, and I think, you know, another kind of challenge for us, although I find it a, a good challenge is, you know, where we are today, how to further enhance and leverage kind of all of the parts. So when you think about Lighthouse, um, 
you know, maybe historically we, um, you know, it was mainly focused on the in cohort companies, but again, being 10 years old uh, or now over 10 years old, we now have a very robust alumni network that we would like to, to serve more appropriately. We have an ever-growing investor uh, network that leans in with each cohort uh, and continues to grow with each cohort. Uh, we have a very strong uh, base of mentors that I think, you know, I'd like to see us formalize a little bit more. And, and we don't stand in a vacuum. I mean, this is all done with with partners. Um, uh, for instance, a lot of our alumni cross over with Startup Virginia uh, just because of the, you know, the geographic uh, similarities. Uh, a lot of our investors are going to probably, you know, cross over around the state with many of y'all on the panel and, and uh, in the audience. So I think it's being, um, being very mindful of that and not trying to necessarily go it alone, but leverage the sum of the parts both internally and externally as an ecosystem. Great answer. Um, okay, Meg, in terms of challenges your organization has faced, um, how do you feel like the community, the folks here on this call, or the state itself could sort of rally around what sort of things could the community or the state do to provide companies that have challenges um, more support? So we have been um, very lucky in terms of the support we've gotten. And I think part of that was just getting to know the community early on through a lot of the programs that we've been talking about on this call. Um, and I think, I guess one of the things that always comes to mind is I wonder how well we're doing in terms of developing relationships with other ecosystems. So I've had the opportunities, opportunities to spend time in ecosystems, you know, all across the country. And just like seeing those groups come together, I think would be really, really powerful and cool and, um, give, you know, confidence to a lot of the area founders as well. It's really the only thing that that comes to mind in terms of improvements. So a, a, a mega I summit. I think y'all are doing a great job. <laughs> a mega summit. I think that would be really interesting also. It was, I got to attend a founder week in, for one of our investors that is not local to Richmond. And it was just cool to have founders from all over the country come together and share knowledge, share investors, share advisors. So I wonder if there's a place for us to do that here. Yeah, great idea. Um, Hunter, can you talk to us about 757 Startup Studios as a new organization, but in a year, I think you already know what sort of things that you need from the community and from the state that would help that organization support more founders? Absolutely. That um, going back to many of our founders, over half are first time entrepreneurs. So they don't have any experience in any type of entrepreneurship, much less this high growth type of entrepreneurship, which is kind of a niche in and of itself. So with that, if you aren't fortunate enough to have affluent friends and family that can write you modest checks to be able to just build out an initial proof of concept or prototype for something like that, it becomes very, very challenging. Um, and this founder journey is grueling and tough and certainly not the path of least resistance for a lot of folks there. So I think more um, acknowledgement and more programs to help people really build out for these early stage companies um, to give them the tools and financial resources and capital. And I'm not talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars, but five or $10,000 can go a really long way to actually have something to help validate their idea. And also understand that many of our founders specifically aren't doing this full time. They have nine to fives. They're doing this. This is one of many hats 
that they wear. So to make sure that there is self-paced learning um, that they can do at their leisure, at their own time, and really honing in on kind of the core fundamentals of good business principles like financial literacy, accounting, legal, where the level of baseline knowledge uh, ranges quite a, a bit from the founders that we see at the super, super early stage that where we're trying to reach and touch entrepreneurs and founders. Great. Um, thank you, Hunter. Hopefully we can get more resources out there. Um, Scott, quick question. I mean, we're facing, you know, we're talking about challenges and, and how you overcome them. And we have sort of a, a economy where we're facing some economic headwinds and you're an investor. So can you talk about how that um, affects NRV and how it affects the founders that you actually are supporting. And investing yeah, in. definitely. Um, the macroeconomic market is such that all companies or, or that are have been fundraising or need to fundraise are, are really looking hard at just sort of the, their burn rate. And we've seen um, companies that we're invested in, there's a focus used to be growth at any cost across the industry to, and perhaps a little bit less so in our area, just because we're a little bit more conservative, but nationally it was growth at any cost and just there'd be a next fundraise at higher valuation. And what investors are, are, are not coming back to the table, there's pressure on valuations. They're coming down, down rounds and things like that. So we're advising, our companies just really take a hard look at your spend just to make sure you can extend your runway as long as possible, just so we won't have to have an, an X round that's possibly a down round or um, or flat, just so. And that, that's that's tough to do when you're kind of have been, you know, adding fuel to the fire, putting your foot on the gas to say, okay, wait, let's hold off a little bit. Marketing dollars are, are getting even more expensive just um, to reach customers. So um, kind of a little bit more cautionary to say, how can you look into postponing your next raise to 24 possibly or later in, into that year? So tough times for sure. It's changed a lot in the last year. Yeah. Um, as it relates to down rounds, I'm not sure everybody on this call knows what a down round is. Can you describe what a down round is and and why there's some negative uh, impact from doing a down round. Sure, it, it basically, uh, when we invest, that we prior to sort of the earlier stages, sometimes there are notes and things like that, but by the time uh, institutional money comes into a, a company, there's a pretty good idea of what valuation you, you can put on it. Sometimes it's multiples, most of the time it's multiple sales and it's sort of negotiated between the founders and the investors. And so ideally um, you want those valuations to go up with every successive round, just so that you um, hold on to sort of your percentage of the company and don't get diluted. Um, a down round basically means your investment that was worth um, a certain amount is then worth, worth less after that stamp, after that point, if it, your valuation say went from $50 million back to 40 or 35 or something like that. So it's sort of things that we as a fund have to report to our investors just because we do an annual audit and kind of say, okay, what's the value of your investments today? And there's a lot of some science, some art to it, just based from the standpoint of just kind of because these companies aren't, um, you know, just the, the financials are still kind of to the point of you're still kind of guessing at some of these valuations that you have to put the numbers on. So we want to be realistic and sort of, as we report to our investors, just until there's a sale or an exit, you really don't know what it's worth. It's kind of, you put some um, different measurements on it. So down rounds, bring your investments down for the portfolio and it's certainly for the, um, the founder, founding team and the other investors in the particular company. Yeah. Uh, down rounds, not not exciting. Um, just so you all know that are watching, the graph that's on the page, um, the x-axis that indicates time is also an indication of risk 
um, too. So um, as you go right, there's less risk. And so when you hear folks on this panel talking about shifting right, they're looking to de-risk their investments a little bit. And in this market with some tough economic headwinds, I think you will see that the capital stack is shifting a little bit right. Um, everybody, I even heard Paul Noldy say that um, from an accelerator standpoint. So, you know, just be cognizant of that. Make sure you get the support that you're looking for uh, and that you need to de-risk your investment um, so you can uh, get capital a little sooner. Um, so sort of uh, being a little more of an optimist, um, Hunter, what are you the most excited about in 2023? I think kind of piggybacking off of the Techstars report um, from a storytelling piece that our entire organization just launched brand new websites and videos. So it's easier to understand what we're doing, how you can get involved. So that's something that we're really excited and have already gotten really good feedback and traction for. And as we continue to make sure that our value proposition aligns with the ever-changing needs of the founders, we continue to have really good feedback. Um, for in-person events, really honing in and doubling down on that community, being surrounded by people that are at a similar stage, tackling similar problems, trying to disrupt and think differently than other folks there. Um, in addition to that, rolling out some new, exciting, potentially pre-acceleration programs and continuing to just kind of level the playing field and reduce obstacles and barriers. So regardless of what you look like, what experience you have, whether you have a degree or not, that you're going to get the same baseline level of knowledge that you can take realizing that studies tell us it's not idea one or two or three. Oftentimes, that's kind of the one. It's idea 10, 11, 12. So by working the steps, by having the community, the resources that you can lean on that will support you in good times and bad, that uh, we're definitely very high and optimistic that 23 will be another record year across the collab innovation network. Thanks, Hunter. I love your enthusiasm. Um, Meg, you've had an incredible year. I just read your investor report last night, and you've had a successful fundraise. So tell us what you expect. What does 2023 have in uh, store for Brandify? I am so excited for 2023. I just think that we have all the fundamentals there to scale. And um, that's really a very exciting place to be in when you've had a long um, journey with many different pivots. Um, so the, the runway feels clear and I'm very excited about that. I think all the things that um, everyone on this call is, have brought up around, you know, being conservative with cash and um, being thoughtful about profitability are all um, very real things that you know we're thinking through, and it's certainly informed our 2023 strategy in ways that you know were this two years ago. Um, it might have been a little different, and I think ultimately that's going to be a great thing for our current investors, um, and our business overall. Just thinking about thinking about being profitable earlier, earlier on and how, you know, product mix and things can inform that. <clears throat> great. I look forward to more great quarterly reports. Um, all right. So switching gears a little bit, we heard um, Greg say at the outset of this call, and we saw in the Hampton Roads, um, ecosystem assessment, how important uh, collaboration was and how important unifying the two regions are. Um, so I'm going to ask um, Paul and Scott this question. Um, how do you all work with Hampton Roads? And then um, Hunter, I'll flip it to you to talk about how we work um, with RBA, because I think we have the makings of a mega region in this ecosystem, but I don't think we talk about it enough. So um, Paul, I'll start with you and then we'll go to Scott. Sure. Um, 
So, you know, I, one thing I have to say is the, the 757 ecosystem has grown remarkably, um, really, I would argue, even quicker than Richmond's in some respects. And I think that's a testament to just the great leadership of you and others, Monique. Um, but uh, we do a lot from Lighthouse Lab standpoint. Um, you know, 757 Accelerate is um, a, a, another accelerator that was modeled after Lighthouse in terms of, you know, um, organization. Uh, so I, I definitely take some best practices from Evans and her team there. Um, I make sure that, you know, we share our deal flow with them and vice versa. I look at Monique and 757 Angels as a uh, prospective investor into the companies that we accelerate and our alumni companies. Um, you know, Hunter and, and, and what he's doing, he mentioned pre-acceleration. I think that is a gap that exists in these two, um, in these two regions that um, is starting to be filled uh, programmatically and otherwise. So here we've got Startup Virginia, they have got 757 CoLab and what Hunter is leading. So I think there's, again, it excites me because there's so much more to refine and, and enhance. But um, from Lighthouse Lab standpoint, I would say that um, our collaboration and partnership with the different components of the ecosystem at 757 is absolutely critical to, I think, leading the way in the state. I mean, we this mega region really can provide some best practices and is already providing some best practices for how it can look on a greater scale. So if we can start here, how can it look even beyond this? So Scott, I'll, I'll let you comment. Now that Paul summed it up nicely with respect to how we can work together. I think I've been in this, doing this for about seven or eight years and I think there was not a whole lot of communication between 804 and 757 and just fortunately that has changed to Paul's point and just to the leadership at 757 and what's been going on there and so I'm proud to say that we've made three investments in companies with the prefix 757 in the tech side of things and just um with Iron Sheepdog and Ario and then um SVT Robotics which I think SVT Robotics came through the 757 Accelerate program, and uh, we were able to participate in an early round for them. And just, um, just great leadership there with AK Schultz, and just some really neat things that they're doing. So I think there's some great success stories coming out, and we're fortunate to be part of hopefully several of them. So um, just good, good job for what y'all been doing down there. Thanks. Hunter, can you talk? I mean, we've talked about sharing deal flow and sharing capital dollars. Um, do you want to add anything else, Hunter? I would just say that if we are always comparing ourselves to, in this particular space, Silicon Valley Research Triangle Park, that we're probably always going to fall short. But there's some tremendous wins, especially in the early days, that it, if you look at it, it takes about 25 to 30 years to really mature and build out an innovation and entrepreneurial ecosystem. And if you take kind of the starting point 10 years away, there's some clues to success that we're doing a lot more things right than wrong. And I think that's doubling down on the organization and the models that are working instead of trying to duplicate or come up with competing entities and also realizing that if we have a founder that is looking for the bio health or something that Lighthouse Labs and Paul and his team, great fit for them with just where they are, the mentorship that they have there. So realizing that we don't need to be all things to all people. And that's why it's just like with anything, keeping the lines of communication opening, figuring out what's working well for folks all across the state um, and specifically Virginia and Hampton Road so that we just have general awareness. So ultimately we can effectively and efficiently connect entrepreneurs with the resources that they need when they need it. Thanks, Hunter. So I think if I'm not mistaken that we have about five minutes left. So I have a couple more questions, but I'm gonna I'm gonna hold on those and and let folks ask questions. I checked the chat. I didn't see a number of questions. I did see a couple comments about Tom Tom Festival. And for all of you, Meg, when you were talking about uh, a summit, 
folks were commenting on um, Tom, 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 Tom made the decision last year when Charlottesville was coming back to COVID to not have a innovation or entrepreneurship focus. Um, I'm not sure what they're doing, but I echo the sentiments of the participants on here. I thought TomTom Tom was a fabulous channel to create awareness around entrepreneurship. So if anybody is on this call that has influence with the TomTom Tom planning committee, I recommend that you uh, get on the horn and give them a call because that was a that was a great conference. Are there any questions? Monique, Monique I was going to say that uh, one of the people that spoke about the TomTom Tom Festival was Michael Barrow, who is the founder and CEO of Lionbird based here in Richmond. He got his start uh, there. So he's on the call as well. And that, that's thanks, Michael, for, for bringing that up. Um, but yeah, are there any questions? We are getting closer to that witching hour at one o'clock. We try to end things. I, I would set, jump in about Tom. Tom, I, I was on the board there, and as they have gone more to a, a Charlottesville focus, I think it creates an opportunity for our region to kind of pick up the, the ball there and figure out how can we do that in between seven five seven and and RVA. So maybe there's somebody on the call that says, "Yeah, let's let's create the, the summit here." So just as Charlottesville sort of changes. And, Tom Tom changes its focus. Great. Um, I know that the IPC is looking, um, but one of the things that I would say to this group of people and the, the 70 people that are still with us is we really need to leverage and, and make things great. So we could start a new thing here, but you know, we really need to work together so that we have some density and attendance. Um, and so um, I would ask that we all think about all these programs and things that we can do and how we can bring you know, more of these organizations in and we can be more collaborative um, versus like creating these little spinoffs that you know, maybe don't go anywhere, don't have the impact that we're looking for because they're duplicative. So just a thought. Um, so I still don't see any questions. If it's okay with you, Greg, I think we're just going to do a quick fire. Does that, is that okay? okay? Yeah, one quick fire and then we'll wrap things okay. up. So the quick fire is, um, and I'm going to start with Scott, go, go to Meg, Paul, and then Hunter. Where do you see the ecosystem in uh, 10 years? Scott first. I'd love to see some exited founders, successful founders that have come back and, and giving back to the community, sort of mentoring dollars and just connections. So um, just a, a good number of those to really accelerate the ecosystem. Agreed. Meg? What Scott said sounds great to me. Oh, <laughs> hope I'm one of them. Um, no, I think um, I think just like that kind of support, continued support is perfect. Hunter? Uh, we're a model that has multiple pathways, such as RVA and 757 Connects, that other folks look to to say this is the right way to go about entrepreneurship and innovation. And I think that the success and the metrics and the exits will come. And Paul? So I'll just kind of tag onto all of those and say that um, I'd love to see a a more um, diverse and deeper capital stack. And not that capital's the end all be all, but in the purposes of what we all deal with every day, um, it is it is an important part of all this. So uh, if we're doing all those other things right, then hopefully we're attracting that capital both from out of state into the state and can you know promoting it so that people in the state will um, will rise up and, and help to fund our founders um, as they go through their journey. So Greg, we're right at one o'clock. I'll let yeah, you- So Monique, I'm gonna ask you that question. You get to answer the question. Where do you think the it will be in 10 years? Gosh, they didn't leave anything left for me. I'd like to see our, um, so I'd like to see these programs be supported, uh, more strongly supported both by the community <laughs> Um, corporate stakeholders. I'd like to see first customer programs for founders. Um, and I'd like to see more funding for these programs. 
ultimately um, resulting in more exits. As um, So from the investment standpoint, we want to see companies grow, fund, and sell. Um, the result of that will be Fortune 500 companies that'll come into our communities that are buying up these smaller businesses, and they'll be creating more jobs. So um, those would be, that would be my hope for the next 10 years. Well, Monique, thank you very much for moderating this uh, wonderful discussion. I was remiss to not to mention, uh, Monique is one of our board members at RVA 757 Connect. So thank you, Monique, for your service to our board and for, for handling this. Also, thanks also to Paul and Meg and Scott and Hunter for participating on this panel discussion. I really, truly appreciate it. It's a fascinating discussion. I think we could continue on. It's something that our organization can work together um, and, and really help uh, innovate and help uh, the whole corridor. Let's, let me, um, so what's next? What's happening next? So you, okay. So uh, what's happening next? I just want to briefly let you know, again, this, uh, this uh, session will be, has been recorded. So if you want to be able to see this later, go to our website at rva757connects.com. Uh, it should be on, on online probably in the next uh, four or five days. Uh, I also will send out an email letting everybody know. If you want to know, learn more about the Global Internet Hub, go to our uh, website, globalinternethub.org. There'll be information there. Um, a month from today, on Wednesday, February the 1st, uh, will be our next Innovation Spotlight. We have a couple uh, right now in the works. Uh, hopefully, in about the next couple of days, we'll be able to announce what those will be. So stay tuned to that. Again, there are ways you can help out RVA 757 Connects if you're interested in uh, following us or suggesting a, a topic or letting us come talk to your business group, please let me know. Again, thank you to the panel. Thank you to Monique. Thank you to the panel. Thank you everyone for, for joining us this afternoon. Hope to see you in a month on Wednesday, February the 1st. Have a great afternoon.